Thanks very much. That, what a hard act to follow, Dr. Vale. Like, you hear what your department has done, and it's so impressive. It makes me feel like very inferior. I've got to get to work harder at Columbia. So, congratulations on all that you've done. So, you know, the, the talk is surgical education, it's not so easy. Uh, you know what else isn't easy? Being Ben Ma and playing residence in uh, basketball. So, I just want to show that. Okay, I just, just check out the distance from the hand to the ball, and then check out that distance from the hand to the ball. And what you can't see is the feet that are being, but there's like no distance, like you have no, that's your best attempt at a jump, that is just pathetic, Ben. That is pathetic, no wonder you instituted the five minute rule. So here's my disclosure, which we've talked about. And again, for this class, it's really been great to get to know you. Uh, if for those of you who don't know the class, if you were a female from Stanford or if you went to Yale, you had a pretty damn good chance of getting into this <laughs> residency program. Uh, and this was them last night celebrating a beautiful dinner um, with uh, Lisa and Tad. Uh, so, you know, when I think about visiting professorships, you know, you're going to talk to an entire department, and so I don't want to talk about reverse or biologic augmentation or throwing shoulder or proximal humerus fractures, uh, because that would really, you know, there's your faculty, and if I did that, those are the only people that would really be interested uh, in them. And so, you know, what do you do? Well, if for those of you who weren't here yesterday, I thought that if any of you didn't have the pleasure of being here, I thought I'd recap. This was all you need to know about what happened yesterday, <laughs> is that this guy was sitting right next to me, and so he says, I fix every fracture, I disagree with everything Levine says, and put a fibula in every shoulder. <laughs> Raise your hand if I summarize yesterday perfectly. All right, cool. All right, great. So. So what, do, what am I going to talk about? One of my kind of most passionate things is surgical education because I can talk to an entire department and hopefully you'll all get something from this. These are the three books I put on my reading list that I tell everybody to read and the graduates just got a, a copy from me uh, on this one, Essentialism. And for the graduates, this is a book that you should read now but you should not implement one thing until year five in practice. So year zero to five is not about where Essentialism starts, it's after year five. But these are three really important books and as we talk about uh, yesterday. Sounds from the Training Room, which we started in, in JAS and Ortho Mentor, are great resources for mentorship for the medical students and residents here. So my goals for today are that hopefully residents will learn some things, fellows will learn some things, and even some attendings. I hope all of you will take a couple of, of pointers. Here's some facts. We have increased restrictions on work hours. We've got increased bureaucracy. We have increased pressures, and we have decreased opportunities in the operating room for our learners. That is not a good combination as surgical mentors and educators. There's also an increased chasm between the generations. There's more us versus them. There's a general misunderstanding of the millennials. We'll talk about that in a moment. There's concerns about shift mentality from the faculty and concerns about too much service from residents. Loss of graduated responsibility, these financial pressures, we've got a bill. Privatization of teaching hospitals is squeezing. Everybody's being squeezed from every angle. Uh, there's this sense of residents' lack of ownership uh, of owning their education. So provocatively, I would say this is a precarious time to be a surgical educator. This is not an easy time for us. And this is the historically, why did this guy want to be a program director? Well, he was a resident advocate. He wanted to help build the best residency program in the country. That's what he looked like when he started. And then like a, six weeks later or six months later, he looks like this. <laughs> and he's not feeling very good. And does the ACGME even care if we're good doctors? I mean, all we're doing is checking these ridiculous boxes. So here are my four things I wanna go over in the next 40 minutes. We're gonna talk about educating the millennials, how you can be an outstanding resident fellow, for the faculty, how to give evaluation and feedback which will improve your lives, trust me, and how to help young surgeons transition in new position. And for the graduates and the fellows back there, some of my former residents, this is really important for you to think about how 
how can you make that transition? So how do we teach the next generation of orthopedic surgeons and how do we evaluate residents' performances? And for the faculty, I'm gonna ask you a simple question. Have you changed your teaching style in the past 20 years, the past 10 years, the past five years, even the past year? Uh, and I would propose to you that you need to think about eliminating didactic presentations like the one I'm giving right now. Uh, so you should eliminate me from this entire meeting uh, and evolve to a case-based curriculum because that's how this generation of learners learns. So you need to think about that. And th as faculty, uh, as chairs, what criteria do we use to hire a new faculty member for an academic institution? Do you know if they can teach? Can they operate? Can they orate? Especially if they're not coming from your own program and we don't know them. And teaching ability, desire, or background is the least likely attribute to be used in that final decision making. Pretty amazing we're bringing these people in to be academicians and we're not entirely sure all the time that that's exactly what they're gonna do well. So how do you educate the modern residents? Generational differences, we're gonna talk about being a millennial. I'm gonna give you a couple of general things and then OR specific things that can be helpful for every one of us and then putting that all together. So who is a millennial? Raise your hands if you were born between 1981 to 1996. Raise them high. You're all millennials. Okay, these are, this is a generation that is entirely misunderstood if you look at the, uh, what's out in press. But this is everything about the millennials. They're not passive learners, very active learners. Uh, they, old methods won't work. They're very tech savvy. Work-life balance is essential. So much healthier than our generation and important to understand that if you're going to work with this group of people. Now, this is not made up. This is a Google search, and if you do millennials are, this is what comes up. <laughs> Lazy, killing, stupid, idiots, what age, the worst, entitled, screwed, killing the napkin industry. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> what did we do to the napkins? So I'm gonna just debunk the four most common millennial myths about work ethic. It is that this group actually works smarter, not harder. They deplore inefficiency and bureaucracy. They strive to do more in less time. They wanna understand why, which we never could ask that question when I was an intern. You just did it because you were told to do it, but you do wanna understand why. And a recent study polled 90,000 Americans and in fact found, you can tell this to your grandparents, that the millennials were hard harder working and more competitive than the baby boomers. So a lot of that stuff is just not true. Entitled, there's no evidence that they're entitled, but you're much more likely to speak up for themselves, uh, even to superiors, not afraid to ask for promotions or raises, and Dr. Vale and I can both uh, attest to that. Most of us were taught to speak up for ourselves, ask for what we believe we deserve, and value ourselves enough to take a risk if needed. So it's not true. Not productive, certainly not true. We need to find better ways to engage and challenge our young workers today because we've changed and the way we work together has changed and so I think that's important and constant praise no they just want bosses who are fair transparent consistent and dependable and you hope to give, get better without uh, an awareness of weakness so this failure to understand the other side is critical and for what we do in surgical education, we do need to understand each other. It's not spoon feeding, it's not that they're lazy, it's not that they don't get it and don't say when I was a resident I walked uphill both ways without no shoes and socks and I only had one pencil. That's not gonna get you very far. Teaching the millennials. So how can you deliver information in this with all of that as a background? And we'll go over some things to do in the OR as well. This is really uh, interesting. Ebbinghaus's Epiphany in 1885 studied memorization of nonsense syllables and tried to remember those and then calculated how long it took before he forgot them all. And so by seven days, he remembered nothing. And that's really important to think about when we're giving these kinds of talks. And you don't want it to be the, that thing sitting in the corner as a, a coat rack, right? So we, we'd like to be using things that people can use. So avoid didactics. Why do I say that? Because again, this generation doesn't learn that way. So pre-COVID, this was my core curriculum talk that Rami and Ajay know. This is us sitting there. And Rami, you look like you had a little more hair there. Um, and this is uh, my talk on anterior instability. And so I, give up, I put up one x-ray, and for the next hour, we're going to talk about anterior instability. No slides. Pretty hard on the, on the mentor, the educator, because you've got to be able to direct the talk to the level of learners, and you've got different levels. We have ones, twos, threes, fours, fives, and fellows. 
Uh, and I don't have slides, so you have to really understand what your goals are. But it's a much more interactive way to teach. And I got news for you. When you tell them that that's going to be the style for that talk, do you think that they read before? Do you think the residents are ready for that uh, talk? A little bit different than if it's a passive talk sitting like this? You better believe it. Then in COVID, we had to go to this. So same x-ray, but now we had it at COVID. And then uh, another thing about pre-COVID, everything was in person, right? And then we went to COVID and we went to virtual. So things change. And I show this just as a reminder. Dr. Vail said, let's rem don't forget. This is my OR where I've operated for 23 years at Columbia. And this was on May 13th, 2020. And this is operating room. And those are one, two, three patients in the ICU makeshift at our hospital. And that's what it sat like for about a year. And that's why we didn't do any elective surgery for a long time. So it was amazing uh, how hard hit we were. COVID education, we've really been able to benefit from this. We talked about this yesterday. Webinars, Zoom core curriculum, case-based symposium, meetings, a webinar last May with 5,200 people registered. So we're really capitalizing, I think, on the one thing that we can from this. Post-COVID education, we're going to see changes. We're going to still see some meetings that are Zoom only. I think you're going to see a lot of hybrid options. You're already seeing that. And of course, thankfully, we're here in person today. When you think about surgical education, think about two rooms and the increased efficiency and autonomy and decision making, all awesome, all good for resident and fellow education. Not good when uh, Spotlight gets a hold of it in 2015 at Mass General. Uh, this led to widespread furor. My chair, uh, CEO, Steve Corwin, called an immediate emergent meeting and said, what's going on? What is our policy? And we had no policy. So by the next day, we had a policy, and this is what it looks like. So overlapping surgery is critical. I talk about this all the time. We have to be ahead of this game, or we will lose this game. So today, we have to have a consent form that has, we must name available surgeon. We must check yes to the overlapping surgery discussed. We must review the patient before they sign the consent. Now this is not going away and you need to stay vigilant because this is just from this year in Pittsburgh uh, where another high profile case is going. So, the, And these are usually whistleblower cases where somebody is going to blow the whistle on. So you have to stay on top of this. So how do we teach millennials the five R's? So research-based methods. We prefer a variety of active learning methods. If they're not interested, the attention shifts. And preferred learning is less lecture, lecture more multimedia, more collaboration, group learning, as we've been talking about. Relevance. Google has changed everything, right? You can look it up anytime, anywhere. You don't have to go up to the library and pull out a textbook. Uh, so it's totally changed. And our role as educators and mentors has changed because it's changed shifted from dispensing info to teaching how do you apply this information because ultimately we want you to be able to take the keys and drive the car and so our challenge is to connect the content to current culture and make our outcomes relevant the rationale again boomers are raised in authoritarian style millennials are raised in non-authoritarian style and they want to understand why and relax they prefer less formal learning environment and laid back is used to describe the best learning environment and the rapport, you are more comfortable with your parents than the baby boomers were, so you thrive better if mentors actually show some interest in your lives. Not that hard. Now, this is a really important thing to think about with OR autonomy. This is the Zwish model, and there are four stages. Show and tell, smart help, dumb help, and no help. So show and tell is where the attending does the majority of the case, but they're thinking out loud. And this is really important. It's been shown over and again that if you're the assistant and the attending or the fellow or a senior resident is telling you what they're doing and why they're doing it and what they're thinking about when they're doing it, you will be more engaged, you will get more out of it, and you'll be more inclined to say, I like that working with that surgeon. If the surgeon does the whole case and they say nothing and do nothing and you're holding hooks the whole time, guess how you get evaluated? It's not very hard to understand. So smart help is now you're shifting between the surgeon and first assistant role. Uh, when first assisting, you lead the resident in the surgeon role. You demonstrate key concepts, anatomy, and skill. You're optimizing field and exposure. You're giving some coaching of specific skills and uh, coaching regarding next steps. And the resident is starting to advance. So now you're shifting between the first assistant and the surgeon role. You're demonstrating the ability to do the key parts of the case with supervision. How do you advance? Well, you can ex execute the majority of the steps of the procedure uh, with active assistance. Now it's dumb help time. 
Now you can set up the case, you can accomplish the next step for the entire case with increasing efficiency, you can demonstrate the ability to do the key parts of the case with supervision, you recognize some critical transition points where maybe you stop and say, hey, can you help me here? And you can transition between all steps with passive assist from the faculty. So you're really starting to make that jump. And then finally, you're at the no help point, which is obvious where we want you to be by the time you finish and go off onto your own. And so that is a very nice way to think about how you can be a surgical mentor. This was a great study published last year that showed brief lectures plus nine hours of supervised deliberate practice ended up being better than two years of residency training. So you can do this in a more uh, con uh, concentrated fashion. So putting it all together, how do you teach the next generation of residents and fellows with less hours, more constraints, and a cry for less autonomy? We have an orthopedic boot camp, one, one month of surgical skills, arthroscopy, fracture management, orthopedic educators course, critical for the faculty. Uh, Dr. Vail, I make this mandatory for all of our faculty. It's the single most influential course I've ever taken. And we have a residency education committee where we evaluate our teachers and make sure that we're all on the same page. Simulation is critical as we've been talking about and virtual reality will clearly be a major part of education uh, in the future. This is Forrest Anderson, one of our fifth year residents uh, playing with uh, Precision OS. Uh, and a number of studies have shown that VR outperforms controls when you look at cadaver studies versus VR and the retention of the learner is 500 to 600% higher with VR than with cadaver training in a number of studies uh, that have been published. And we're currently doing a prospective RAF study with one of our interns, now PG2s, uh, uh, looking at cadaver versus virtual reality uh, with a modified uh, reverse total shoulder arthroplasty study. So hopefully we will find the same things. So we have a lot of barriers to OR autonomy and things we all need to think about as surgical mentors to hopefully help our residents and fellows uh, do a better job. So when you think about educating millennials, try not to say when I was a resident, don't say millennials don't like to work hard. Why are they so unprepared? I hate ortho bullets and view medi because unfortunately that's what they're going to use. Paul Tornetta hates both ortho bullets and view medi like you can't believe. Uh, but we as educators need to adapt. We don't need to change our our goals or our values, we just need to adapt. And so you need to change in the clinic and OR teaching can make your life better and VR and MR will be part of our future. So for the residents and fellows, how can you be an outstanding resident and fellow? This is a two-way street. You can't expect that both sides know what the other's thinking. It takes work, it's worth it, but the alternative stinks if you don't do this. And we go back to Halstead in the late 1800s where we got the term house staff because we weren't supposed to be leaving the hospital. We were supposed to be at the hospital the whole time. Uh, education and sacrifice discouraged from marrying. Really a great guy. <laughs> That's where this all started. So this was the Columbia residence in 1966 and 1967. You can see the incredible diversity. There's uh, different sized ties, I think, is about the best you can do. They all have the same white coats, but what is really impressive is all of those gentlemen went on to be chairman of orthopedic departments, including this guy right here, uh, David Bradford. So an unbelievable residency class. And this is what we look like today in 2022, and this is what you look like in 2022. So residencies are changing, uh, as Dr. Vale has said. So for the, what are the top five traits that I think are critical for you all and for all of us uh, as residents. And here they are. So with trust, it, talk about it on day one with our interns because reputations are easily obtained and nearly impossible to get rid of. If you get a reputation as a good resident, you get a lot more latitude. Not so good resident, less latitude. So really important to think about that. And there's probably no more important quality in medicine than trust because that's what we do. We trust each other to see a patient and tell us that you saw that patient and examined that patient. It leads to increased autonomy. It leads to increased ownership. And I always just use the simple thing, treat people like your family members. If you do that, you're usually gonna stay in good shape. Uh, so junior resident to senior resident, senior resident, all of these relationships. Ryan, you're a great looking model, by the way. That was awesome. Um, they all rely on trust. 
And so own your education. In the old days, again, residents were afraid to not know the answers. We never said, I don't know, because that would be a bad day. Today, it's easier to say it, so there's a potential to misinterpret. And we have to make sure we don't misinterpret that for apathy. Oh, they're a millennial, they don't understand. Accountability, transparency, don't assume anything uh, from either side. Our residency education committee is critical. That's where we cover all events related to the residency. Where's Dr. Kim? Is she here? Erin? Oh, she's not here. Oh, are you here? I'm here. Oh, okay. Hi, Erin. So this is what I, what uh, someone, one of your faculty members said about you, great hands, loves good food, and all things fancy. I love that. <laughs> Early arrival, late departure, do the right thing, super smart and right up there with the nicest person you'll ever meet. People say nice things about you guys. So work, role models, you cannot teach work ethic. This is something that's genetic, it's your part of your phenotype. People say you're old school, that's what you would hope people will say about you. Communication is critical, uh, and it's one of the things that leads to the, the highest number of medical errors. Uh, patient care, emotional stability, and five keys to communication that I think about. Find common ground, keep the communication simple, capture the other person's interest, inspire people, and stay authentic in all your relations. This is from a book from John Maxwell. Again, learn about millennials. Don't say this stuff and understand their perspective. Please, please, please seek feedback and find out how you're doing so that you don't make it through the end of a rotation thinking you were doing great when the other person doesn't think you were doing great. Now, professionalism. This is where I use the New York Times rule. Don't send an email that you don't want printed on the front page of the New York Times. Don't write something in Epic that you don't want printed in the New York Times or to go to Dr. Vale is something that you don't want seen. So this was in 2017. Harvard took away 10 acceptances for offensive memes in private group chat that got viral. Uh, this picture came out this past year uh, on uh, Instagram, and I happened to see it. So this is what was named in this picture. The residency program, the time and date of the operation, the name of the fourth year resident, the name of the first year resident, and the type of operation. So you think there's enough information there for the family to figure out exactly who their family member was when they had that operation? And this is what wasn't named, the attending having any role whatsoever in this case. So in the social media pandemic and craze, to, we all had to figure out how can we let medical students know how great our residencies are, this is what happened. So I asked my residents to take a look at this, and this is what was going on. New Instagram accounts, marketing, hey, look at how great we are and how um, autonomous we are. I love this one. There's nothing more satisfying than having your intern slam a nail down. Now this is on public, this is a public forum, social media. Can you imagine families and patients reading this? So what did we do? We went and looked at it, and so we published a paper on it. 72% of residency programs, 65% created between April and December of 2020. Uh, you can see the posts that were analyzed, and 93% depicted residents scrubbed alone. Uh, we called 81 of these concerning posts. So I think this is something that every program needs to think about. And as I said, this was just published in uh, 2022. The three A's, availability, affability, ability. Where's Erica? Oh, hi, Erica. Fracture whisperer. <laughs> All around badass. NCAA rowing champion, oh, of course. Um, identify early your goals. Do you want to be a leader? Do you want to be a chief resident? Do you want to go into academics? Do you want to go to an employed model? Do you want to be in privademics? Uh, Heather, seriously outstanding person and clinician surgeon. I think she was an angel sent down to earth to be an amazing doctor and surgeon. Love that. For myself, only person I know who does not own a TV. Uh, Will, do you want to go to a top tier fellowship, middle tier, lower tier? You, just, you decide that early on by your actions here as a resident and for medical students, uh, wherever you go to residency. Super salty and sarcastic, but in a good way. <laughs> I like in the good way. No pictures on social media anywhere, so he cannot be accused of any of those other things we were worried about. Successful senior resident, you're a mentor, you're a role model, you, you set the standards. Monica, excellent hand, loves to bake, one of the nicest people on the planet. Yeah, another NCAA champion. Got a lot of those. So successful senior resident, what is learned is more important than what's taught. This is called the hidden agenda, and I talk to our residents all the time. 
Do you want to create an environment that residents want to emulate? What's your legacy going to be when you leave the place after five years? And for fellowship pursuit, we talk about the pipeline. One good resident starts it and one bad resident ends it. And you can't tell programs that you're ranking the number one and then not do so. You are not a solo practitioner here. You are an ambassador representing UCSF or wherever you happen to do your residency. So don't show up in the OR unprepared. Don't dump responsibilities on another residents. Don't mistreat those below you. Don't get into conflicts with folks and don't score in single digits on in-train because it just makes everybody really nervous. Rising chief residents, don't spread yourself too thin. Challenge yourself daily, elicit feedback from everyone, make goals and hold yourself accountable. Don't forget to call your loved ones. And remember, it's the last year of your residency, so soak it all in, because you can't get that time back. Now, successful fellows, it's weird. All of a sudden, you've got this different role. You're walking a tightrope. You're not an attending. You're not a resident. What is this all about? And this is my fellowship circle of life that the fellows can all appreciate. End of residency, you are at the top of the mountain. You know everybody. You've got, you've got everything down. You start your fellowship. You're like, excuse me, where's the bathroom? You know nothing. End of fellowship, you're top of an even higher mountain, and now you guys start your first job and you're back to, excuse me, where's the bathroom? So it's the circle of life of education and, and uh, your job pursuit. It's really interesting. So to be a successful fellow in the OR, we talk about see one, do one, teach one. Write down every step, and this is for every resident and every student. This is something you should be doing right now. Write down every step with the faculty member you're doing the case with. Review each step prior to the OR. You're going to use that for the rest of your life. And I'm talking nitty-gritty. Where was that retractor? Why did Dr. Vale have that exposure that I can't do in my own OR? Well, it's because he had the retractors in a specific place, so write that down. Uh, my partner, Chris Ahmad, has written this book, Skill, and, and we talk about this in our residency all the time. You should be able to perform the entire procedure in your mind before you do the, the operation. Uh, Dan Rue, who I brought to Columbia from WashU, talks about ACDFs and says, if the fellow writes down every step from start to finish the way I do it, he lets the fellow go until they go off script. And the second they go off script, the sharp, dangerous object goes back into his hand. So they learn pretty quickly his script, not anybody else's script. In the office, Sashin, clone of the attending, learn their specific jargon, take a concise but critical history, review the images, go out on a limb, and be a one-minute preceptor. This is a really important concept. Most caring and wonderful person, heart and soul of the residency program. People think pretty highly of you. It's really nice. And, of course, the chief fitness officer. One minute preceptor, get a commitment. So you're gonna ask, the resident comes out, and you're gonna ask them to give you the diagnosis. You're gonna probe for their reasoning, teach some general rules, provide positive feedback and correct errors. You can do this all in one minute when you're mentoring students, residents, fellows in the office. It's really important. I don't wanna hear a 30 minute presentation. Let's get right to the heart of it and tell me what you're thinking because we don't have that time. As far as research goes, pick something you're interested in. You want two projects of publishable quality. Don't ever say this. I'll finish the project when I'm in practice because that will never happen. Once you leave, it's really hard to finish when you're done. Faculty, evaluation and feedback. My pet peeve. End of year residency evaluation, faculty meeting, Kaz was terrible. Dr. Kim says, did you talk to him? The attending says, no. Well, that's really valuable, really helpful, right? So set goals and feedback. These are game changers and it's critical for these generational differences. It's gonna make your lives better and b don't assume anything. Again, the educators course, I make it mandatory for all my faculty. Uh, it's unbelievable, it's November uh, every year, it sells out every year and it totally will change the way you educate. So if Tiffany's coming on to my schedule, she's gonna get a call from Melissa who's gonna schedule three meetings with her, one prior to the start of the rotation, one at the midpoint, and one at the end of rotation. That is booked, nothing will uh, interrupt those three meetings. So what's gonna happen? At the pre-rotation meeting, we're gonna do Bogard. We're gonna talk about background, the clinical experience, reading for cases, similar situations. We're gonna do opportunity, what's going to transpire, what are your opportunities for learning and for performance. The goals, okay, this is a, I love this one. So Joe's a PG2 and he's on my service. What are your goals for the rotation? Well, I wanna do a revision reverse total shoulder from skin to skin. And then I say, okay, let's narrow that down just a tad. And then he says, to get the patient in the room, properly positioned, prepped and draped, and do the approach. I'm like, okay, well, that's very manageable. This is a revision reverse case, so let's try to start there. 
Evaluation, how are you going to be evaluated? Observation, verbal, written feedback, performance criteria, is it going to be speed, number of patients, or accuracy? And what's the bailout? And when will I step in? And then when will we step back out? And then you make a deal. That's the deal. That's what's going to happen on this rotation. And then you get feedback. It's constructive. It's not at the end of rotation only. There's some curbside, but then you want formal feedback with Pendleton rules. This was adapted from a British marriage counselor, uh, formalized feedback. It's totally non-threatening. It goes like this. Ask the resident what went well. Tell the resident what went well from your perspective. Ask the resident what could have been done differently. Tell the resident what could have been done differently. Use the gold standard as benchmark. It's really non-threatening, simple, easy to do. And it's amazing when you ask the first question and the third question, sometimes there is a huge disconnect. And if there's a huge disconnect, that's going to be a longer meeting. If there isn't a huge disconnect, it's a really short meeting. So it's uh, very interesting. And does it work? I've benefited incredibly from this. My faculty who use these techniques have. And my friends and colleagues who I've mentored over the years have definitely benefited greatly. And again, this course sells out every single year. It's in its 54th year. All right, we're gonna finish up with faculty. How to help young surgeons transition to new position. So I'm a new faculty or attending, and what are the keys to success? How are you getting patients? How are they getting assigned? Is it ra random? Is there an algorithm? Uh, is it which attending brings the nicest gifts to your appointment schedulers? You wanna know that going in. For office hours, do you have someone to help you? With Epic and electronic health records, it is hard as a doctor to put in all the orders, do all the work, see the patients, get the rooms ready. Who's going to be helping you? Do you have an MA? Do you have an ATC? Are there metrics necessary to achieve when you may get an advanced practice professional in your practice? Those are good questions to ask when you are looking at jobs. What happens in the operating room? Are there two surgeons? Do you work with one of your partners? Is there a first assist? Is there a PA? Is there an NP? Are there fellows? Are there residents? All of a sudden, you've come from fellowship and residency where there's like four million people helping you, and all, you go into practice, and you may be the only person there, and now you're wondering, how am I going to get that exposure? So this is the classic academic paradigm that I always talk about in the, uh, for the operating room, and it goes something like this. You're a new faculty member, you get the worst OR time, often no OR block time, so it's late in the day. You have the most difficult cases because the senior folks say, hey, look what I'm referring to you. Uh, you have the least experienced support, maybe a PG2, maybe someone lower than that. And we wonder why confidence can be shattered. And I've seen this, unfortunately, over and again uh, from friends and, and colleagues who share their experiences with me. So this is really something that's avoidable. So how do you avoid it? Well, you scrub with a senior partner. You steady the ship. You avoid complex cases late in the day with poor environment. You review cases with your mentors. And don't be afraid to ask for help, especially when you're getting started. That's critical for the patient. It's critical for you and your confidence. And mentorship is something that I, we, we could talk a whole uh, you know, day about, but it's really important. It's critical in all organizations, so why isn't it more critical in medicine? 70% of the Fortune 500 companies have a formal mentorship program, and in orthopedic surgery, 90 to 95% of students want it, but less than one-third have access to it. So it remains this unsolved problem that we really, I think, together as a community have to figure out better. So as I think about the summary for residents, take ownership, prepare like it's your organic chemistry final. You never would have taken that final without being prepared, uh, and communicate. For fellows, you're starting all over again, but you're going to rise to the top of the, mo of the mountain, and don't be arrogant or afraid to ask for help. And for faculty, understand the new generation of learners. Modify, adapt, but don't lower your standards and expectations, and learn how to be a good mentor. Learn how to be a better sponsor for their uh, future success. And senior faculty and leadership, ensure the success of your new recruits. If you're the division chief, don't say, here's the keys to your office, and I'll see you in a year at the end of year evaluation. Uh, really work to make sure that you're making that transition as successful as it can be. If you don't change, you can become extinct. And as Malcolm X said, education is the passport to the future, for tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for it today.
So what does the future hold? Well, don't forget, what is our ultimate goal? Why are we all here? Because we're training the next generation of leaders, uh, which is really cool, and we're really privileged and blessed to have such that an honor. Uh, special thanks to Tad and Lisa for being incredible friends and hosts uh, for this event, and really a, a incredible. I, I'm so blown away by the uh, residents and by the department and what you've created. It's really quite remarkable. And to the group here, the faculty, who have many are friends uh, over the years, and some are taking care of my sister, who I, I can't ever thank enough. Uh, uh, so thank you so much. And to you guys for organizing an incredible program. Uh, really re uh, great uh, uh, program. The best part of mentorship is this. So this is uh, Lan on her first day when she was a uh, PG-1, and this is at her PG-5 roast with the uh, residents, and then here she is today, a faculty member in, uh, here at UCSF. Uh, this is Jay, of uh, many opportunities to spend time with Jay in all walks of his fellowship life, and then to see him now and uh, with an incredible family and all the things that he's doing, and this is what we do. We pay forward to our mentees, and then they surpass us and get better than us and that's the the value of mentorship and of course Sarah who is uh, where is Sarah there she is um, Sarah, who um, you know was just one of the most incredible fellows I've had the pleasure of uh, training, and has you make that that transition from mentor mentee to colleague to friends, and that's the the life cycle of mentorship that's really so incredible. So thank you. There are two honors in academic medicine that have meaning from my perspective. One is being named Teacher of the Year, and the second is a visiting professor for graduation. It's an incredible honor to do so, uh, and thanks again to all of you uh, who uh, are really. Uh, quite remarkable and I'm looking forward to see what you do in the future. I'm gonna finish with a quiz um, so you guys get to tell me who this is because this is from your own personal statements from your heiress applications five years ago. <laughs> All right, resident one, who is this? Monica? Monica? Any other? You guys don't even remember, do you? Monica's going, I don't know. Anybody else want to guess? Aaron Kim. All right. This one is so easy that I can't even stand it. Yeah, I mean, that was like, that was a no-brainer. All right. OK, this one will be a little more challenging. Who is this? Heather, now Heather's the only person who chose not to submit a picture with her heiress application. Smart move, Heather. Heather is like, just pick me because of who I am. I like that. All right, here we go. Who's this one? <laughs> Will, did you, Will, did you remember that? No, no clue. Love it. All right, number five. <laughs> I mean, if you say Monica enough times, you have to be right. <laughs> there you go. And guess who this is? There you go, Erica. All right, thanks very much for your attention. Appreciate it. <laughs>